Welcome to WeIQ TV. I'm Judith Glazer, your host, and I am so excited to have you here today for an interview that I've been waiting for for 11 years. Now that may sound strange to you, but John Barge, who you're going to be uh, hearing from today, is uh, the author of a new book about unconscious and consciousness, and he has been working on this for 11 years, and I met him on the phone 11 years ago talking about his work. John, I am beyond thrilled to have an opportunity to spend time with you here at Yale in your office, in your workspace, in your thinking space, and to learn more from you directly beyond what's in the book and what's in the book, um, because this is the most thrilling and exciting topic for our coaches, mm -hmm. many of them who have studied consciousness in different ways and mindfulness and all mm -hmm. sorts of things. But you are the, now considered to be the world expert. How does that feel to you? I don't know about being the world expert in anything, uh -huh. but uh, it is something that I've uh, wanted to study my whole life, my whole career since college. Mm -hmm. And it, probably even before that, I remember being eight years old and wanting to be a psychologist, which is hardly the usual thing for an eight-year-old to want to be. My goodness, what was the incident? I think I wanted to understand my family. You know, I think like most of us, you know, like I, I came from a huge extended family. My my uh, mother had nine brothers and sisters, and they oh all goodness. had five and six kids, and I had forty or fifty cousins, and we all lived in the same town and the family reunions, you know, the Easter oh dinners God. and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so it was, it was a blast, and there were it was great, great growing up that way. But it was it it, uh, it gave me a lot of different kinds of people with all these different kinds of personalities, even though we all shared most of our genes, you know, because we're in the same family, um, and it made me interested. And when I got to college, it was the time when B.F. Skinner was writing books like Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and uh, uh, people were really going through a crisis mm -hmm. about uh, whether there was free will. We had this horrible World War II, and a lot of the existentialists like Sartre and others uh, really wanted to say, look, we can do something about this. We have free will. And then Skinner comes along, the behaviorist, and no, we don't have free will, and it's an illusion. And so I, what is this? And I got reading into that and understanding it. And this is when psychology was really starting as a science, because before 1970s was dominated by rat psychologists, by behaviorists. And they weren't studying people, and they weren't studying the mind. Mm -hmm. It was almost a taboo topic until the 1970s, which is when I started. So yeah. wow, here we go. And uh, we can start studying these things and learning and applying scientific methods to understand how they work. So it was like the Skinner and Freud era that I remember when I was uh, back studying as well. and. It's a phenomenon. So it, what caught your attention was something about this unconscious area. There was, there was a sort of a, a, almost a, an extreme swing to the other side in the 1970s, of What's course. What's the other? The other side was everything is under your control, mind over matter, that your mind, uh, you can transcend everything, and your mind is so powerful. And consciousness is everything, and it's what separates us from animals, and it's responsible for our civilization. And every, every wonderful thing about the world was put into the uh, uh, column for consciousness. And, our conscious mind uh, did that, and, and I was a little skeptical. I thought, this is wishful thinking. This is sur sure the way we wanted to feel about ourselves. We're so superior and all of that. And I always was hesitant to, to buy into things that we want to believe. That's not really science. We can't just uh, uh, find things that we want to be true. We have to see things as they really are. So while this was going on one direction, I was sort of contrary and going the other direction and saying, wait, I hold it. You know, maybe there is something to behaviorism, maybe there is something to influences that we're not aware of, maybe there is something to Freud, uh, maybe we're not totally in control and aware of everything we're doing all the time, which is what everyone was saying back then. Yep. So um, I, now I know one of the reasons why I love you and your work so much, it's that contrarian spirit where you're challenging even conventional wisdom. It was, in your mind, it wasn't either or. It started to become something different that your imagination had put together. And Absolutely. That's, it, that's yeah. what brought me to you. Yeah. Um, but 11, nice. 11 years ago, yes. when I first talked to you, you were doing research on hot and cold or warm and cold. Is it warm and cold or hot and cold? It's, it's, it's interesting. That's actually an interesting topic because we have two different metaphors both involving temperature. One is warm and cold, mm -hmm. where we talk about a warm relationship or a cold father, things like that. But we also have a hot and cool one, where we're hot under the collar or we're cool and, and collected, like cool mm -hmm. as a cucumber. Mm -hmm. And those are different, actually completely different metaphors. Yeah. The warm cold has to do with trust and generosity and, and does someone have your back or they are they against you? The hot and cool has to do with emotional regulation, emotional control. They're totally separate things, but they both involve temperature. So a lot of times people say, well, isn't hot even more than warm, so it should be even better? No. You know, there's an old story that a psychologist wrote about his four-year-old child in the bathtub. 
and the, it was in the bathtub and the water was coming in, he was doing it, and the, and the child said, warmer, warmer, and so the psychologist's father turned the tap on the hot water, and, the, and the, 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 his son went, no, no, warmer, warmer, <laughs> and so he said, what? But to that child, hot wasn't warm. I mean, little little four-year-old in the bathtub could be parboiled if you turn the water up too That's hot, right? right? So, exactly. so it's like, oh, the hot water. Yeah. So he wanted warm, and he knew that he knew the difference at four years of age. He knew what he wanted. Warm and hot. He knew what he wanted, but he didn't know how to get there. Right. I and mean, that's fascinating. And we assume that, oh, hey, hot is just more warm, so right. it can be even better, but right. it's, it's not. It's not. Okay. So, um, so this is fascinating that you're opening up this. How does the body register the warm and cold or hot? Either, either one of those metaphors um, in the body. Before I get to that though, what I want to make a point to share with all of our audience and mm -hmm. coaches and so forth is um, there are, in, in conversational intelligence, we study words and words as metaphors and how metaphors influence us dramatically. So now you've opened our eyes mm -hmm. to a very powerful metaphor yes. that takes us inside the body yes. that we want to know more about because when we work with our clients, they get excited to learn neuroscience of conversations and relationships are what enable us to have those conversations. Absolutely. So this is one of the areas that will thread throughout our conversation today. Metaphors have become a very big deal in psychology and, and pretty much the last 10 or 15 years we didn't really realize uh, back in the old days of social psychology, almost 100 years ago, uh, people found that the, the terms warm and cold were so powerful in how we formed impressions of people. If we heard somebody was warm, then all the other things you know, didn't matter so much. They were warm and that, that was, if a person was cold, I don't care if they're intelligent and hardworking, that was like a bad thing if they were cold. So warm and cold has been a huge, uh, a huge dimension in, in uh, well, why do we use the words warm and cold? Why don't we say friendly or unfriendly? Why don't we say uh, loyal or betrayal? Or why don't we, or friend or foe? We, yeah. we use warm and cold and these are why? physical why? states. So okay, what? so I was watching the History Channel and the History Channel for some reason every night when I was watching had a documentary on hell. So I basically called it the Hell Channel. So I'm watching the <laughs> Hell Channel and they had a feature on Dante. Well of course you know they would have a feature on Dante and I'm watching Dante and about Dante and he's talking about the levels and going down 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 you know lawyers are on five and murderers are on seven and and what's the worst I mean, murderers are on seven and go down to nine the, the lowest level Low that's where nine. the devil is that's yeah. where Satan is and that's where turns out Judas is who <laughs> betrayed uh, Christ so what's going on here well that's where they uh, the worst sin of all to Dante uh, was when someone you trusted betrayed you when someone who was a friend or someone who was close to you betrayed you which how Judas betrayed Christ and actually the other person on this side of the devil is the person who betrayed Dante uh, to the authorities back in the you know 1300s okay fine so they're in the the lowest uh, worst pit of hell what's their punishment you know here we are in fiery hell fire and brimstone right what's 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 down in, in level nine they're all frozen in ice. What? And I'm watching this, what? They're frozen in ice. And you know, Dante is where we get the idea of poetic justice, the contrapasso, the punishment that fits the crime. So let me just stop for a second. Yeah. So if I have an experience with you where I ignore you, which might be nine because right. it's not, it's the worst not, case, it's, it's frozen. Well, okay, yeah. but I'm freezing you out of my life in a uh, way, there's right. another metaphor, right? right? That's right. And then my body is actually experiencing some place, is that what you're saying, in my right. brain or in my body, whichever. Right. I want you to just explain to us what gets activated in the brain. So, so Dante, the great poet, was sensitive to this. And what's interesting is 800 years later, neuroscience confirmed what Dante was thinking. Fascinating. The idea that, that hell has, uh, what St. Peter said even earlier, 2,000 years ago, that hell hath rivers of ice for the cold-hearted. Hmm. What? So the cold-hearted, the idea of betrayal and not being trusting and being cold to somebody and not caring about them was punished by being frozen in ice. So there's this idea, there's this connection between physical coldness and social coldness or physical warmth and social warmth. So I can freeze you out of my life is a one to or you extend can warm the metaphor. Up to somebody. Or I can warm up to somebody. So when, when I first found your work and I invited you to come to our institute, I, I want to share with everybody, if you don't mind, what you said to me. You said, I would love to come except I'm working on something and I, I need to be working on it without 
mixture with other things. And so I don't yeah. want to be in a sharing mode at this point because yeah. I'm in a building creating mode with I, it. I, I hope, I beg your uh, forgiveness and understanding for what I said <laughs> oh, totally. because I said it to other I people it. too. Yeah. I was invited to one of these wonderful Woods Hole conferences and I said no for the same reason. I had just had uh, a dream and this dream uh, it w it was an alligator in the Everglades and the alligator dream changed me completely. It was a revelation that totally, I, I saw everything for the first time in a new way and it was very fragile. And I was working my way through it and I, I didn't want to go and talk to anybody or present anything because I wasn't really getting it yet. I just knew how important this was and this happened in the fall of 2006. So you didn't want to be influenced by outside conversations that might in some way yeah. push you in a direction that wasn't yeah. your direction. Especially about the topic, of yeah. the, 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 uh, Woods Hole was about uncon the unconscious and I just, I, until I had it, mm -hmm. until I understood it and I finally did in, in two or three years later but it was a total turning point where I didn't really understand for 20, 25 years what we were finding and what other people were finding and the alligator dream plus, plus this fragile Gradual uh, turn of change of mind finally solidified, maybe 2009 or 10, yeah. uh, which is when I actually could start writing because I didn't understand it before yeah. that. Fascinating. So what was the alligator? What was the message that you got? So my daughter was born in 2006 and she never would take a nap and it was exhausting and I was uh, up, up in the attic of our, um, uh, sort of a tree house of an attic in our house in New Haven. And uh, I was trying to get her to uh, go for a nap because I was just exhausted. I needed to sleep. Um, and so I finally did. I got her in her crib and I went and I fell face down on the bed. This is fall, it was September um, of 2007, um, uh, 2006 actually. And uh, I had a dream. And I, I had one of these vivid dreams, lucid dreams. And it was just so intense and so real. And in the dream, I was in the Everglades National Park in Florida walking on those raised platforms and looking down, there was an alligator and walking, sort of keeping up with me as I walked along. It was swimming next to me. It's okay in, in, in this dream. Then it swam a little in front of me and then it flipped over and it looked at me and I woke up immediately. I couldn't have been asleep more than 10 minutes. And I under, every, it was like everything, a weight had fallen from my shoulders, a, an incredible rush of relief of tension because I had had this question that my unconscious actually was working on for 10 years or 15 years and I couldn't understand it and finally it all came to me and I understood it. Now what in the world would an, would an alligator flipping over have to do with psychology or anything I'm working on? It's because in our field we always thought of things became unconscious where you weren't aware of them and all that, uh, that they always started out in consciousness. Like when you learn to drive or type or any kind of skill, it starts out being very effortful, you're very aware of it, and only with lots of practice it becomes unconscious. Automatic. Yeah. That's what our field, and our, many in our field still believe this even today. Yet, there are all these findings, and incredible findings in developmental psychology, studies of infants and babies and toddlers, showing that they had the same kinds of skills and did the same kinds of things that adult, adults did. Hardwired? Is well, that when, it, right, had, it had to be there not from experience. It, it mm -hmm. wasn't conscious first. They didn't even have, con barely right. conscious uh, already themselves. Right. The blank slate concept. How, how do you reconcile not, those findings right. with this thing about it takes lots of conscious experience? And no one had done that. And I yeah. realized, well, clearly, I, I got the, uh, I finally drank the evolution Kool Aid, is what I did, right? Yeah. So I, I, I finally realized, oh, wait a minute. Consciousness comes after unconscious in evolutionary history. Consciousness is a relatively late add-on to our mind. Yeah. And we have all these old systems that were there before consciousness. So the alligator is saying, flip it. Unconscious comes first, so, then conscious, yeah. not the other way around. And then everything made sense. Everything made sense. Everything so, made sense. So this marries with when I was studying the brain for the first time and we had the triune brain. Mm -hmm. Right, the primitive brain, the limbic brain, and the neocortex. Mm -hmm. God only knows, uh, you know, here is this beautiful thing called the uh, prefrontal cortex, which right. appeared right before 2000, like in the 19, nine, late right. 90s, right. something like Absolutely. that. Yeah, and uh, in Parva, Italy, they did all these tests about the um, mirror neurons, and it was proving that this brain had all these amazing capacities that we need to understand. Rizzolati, Galesi, I, yeah. I have the mirrors in the brain book right here. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah fascinating the, the, stuff. The, the, neuro, the mirror neurons influenced me a lot because we were doing research on on imitation and mimicry and that's totally supported the idea that um, that what you saw other, others doing is what made it more likely you would do right. the same thing. And that those mechanisms are hardwired in us Absolutely. to automatically do that. Absolutely. That, those parts that grew 
have capacity that now you are saying there's a lot more here that we have to go under the surface and explore. And so I want to put some closure on the hot and cold because... <laughs> um, I was thinking of a way to get back to that. So here you are. <laughs> well, so, so I'm doing the Dante thing and realizing that, well, Dante is saying that you know, physical coldness and social coldness are connected. And so we have these studies that warm and cold. So why are we talking warm and cold? And we understand each other so well in these metaphors. When we summon someone, someone's warm, we understand what the other persons mean. Uh, and it's that's actually universal around the world. Uh, all people use warm universal and cold. Universal meaning. All, 160 different around countries. The world, around the world. Around the world. Right. It's the number one uh, dimension of people forming first wow. impressions of other people is warm wow. and cold around wow. the world, everywhere. So, so it's universal. That means it's something about human nature, which means yes. it may be hardwired. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to have people just briefly hold a, a cup of hot coffee or iced coffee before the experiment even started. Oh, here, I have to get your materials, and here, hold this for me, and, oh, and took it back, thank you. It was either hot coffee or iced coffee. If they held the hot coffee, they liked the person they read about more. They thought that person was more trustworthy, generous. Uh, if they'd held the iced coffee, they didn't like the person as much. They thought they were not trustworthy and not. It was the physical Ooh, warm and cold <laughs> that caused the social warm and cold impression. Yeah. And, and here's the kicker. Everybody in the study read the same thing. They didn't read different people. They all read the same thing. But if they had held the coffee briefly first, hot or cold changed their impression. So we said, oh. there's something hardwired here. Dante was onto something. And since we did that study, the neuroscience, mainly at UCLA, has shown there's actually a, a, a connection between those two locations. What uh, becomes active in your mind in the human insula when you hold something warm is connected to when you're texting your family and friends on your iPhone. And if you uh, hold something cold, it's connected to the area that that becomes active if someone betrays you in an economics game by which, keeping all the money for themselves. Which part of the brain is that? You mentioned the insula, insula. for the warm. It's both in the insula. It's a small little walnut-shaped part right central in the middle of the brain, and it's like a junction box. Lots of things feed in, and it, it projects to lots of other areas, including the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so if I not didn't have warm and cold in my hands, but if I am meeting you and I'm going to have a conversation, and I look like this, and I see you're thinking, but I didn't know you were thinking about something else. I thought you were thinking about me, and it looks deceptive or devious or something like that. Is that cold insula connection taking place from something as simple as that, even though I'm not holding warm and cold? Right. And I'm already now set up for sure. distrust with sure. you. Sure. The, the, the area that, that becomes active when you sense uh, you can't trust somebody is not just activated by, by actual physical coldness. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, also uh, by cues about the person, like not looking you straight in the eye, for oh. example, or uh, certain about their tone of voice or their hesitation when they say something. There's lots of cues that we pick up when we, we uh, feel like we can't t uh, trust somebody. And interesting, if we get that feeling in that area of, of social coldness, we can't trust that person, then lots of other things don't happen, and, and they're immediate. For example, we, we tend not to naturally imitate that person, where normally we do. Mm -hmm. uh, hand movements of somebody who's betrayed us, we don't naturally imitate those right. without even realizing. So we, we do not set down the road to cooperation once that coldness feeling sets in. We do, don't do the next steps that we need to coordinate and, and, uh, and, and uh, cooperate with them. This is like the concept of the two different doors. If you go in this door, your train ride is completely different than if you go in this door on the train. And it stays there. It doesn't dislodge itself. Right. It becomes a primary influence. Absolutely. The power of that is huge for people um, that we're working with because they work with teams and they're yeah. sitting in a meeting. Let's say they have co-heads co of this com company. I happen to have that happen for, in a law firm. And they never looked at each other. They were both working hmm. supposedly as pairs, but the audience, their 18 people, saw them sitting like this and mm -hmm. they'd come to me afterwards and say, they don't even like each other. Right. And I say, what did you see? And they say, they don't turn towards each other, they're turning away. This, is, this is so interesting. I just have to jump in because there was a study done on 18-month-old children about 10 years ago where the, what they did was they showed uh, colorful toys, but in the corner of the picture for one group of children were two dolls, two colorful little plastic dolls, a boy and a girl, facing each other. But for some of the children, they were facing away from each other. Wow. And then they had control conditions with blocks and things like that. But what happened afterwards was, was really interesting. The experimenter came and said, okay, now we're gonna play with these toys, and oops, drop the toys. And she wanted to see which children spontaneously came without being asked to come and help pick them up, mm -hmm. which is cooperation and helping. Can I guess? 
Please. The ones that were talking to each other. Three not, times more children came yeah. if they had just saw, seen the dolls, dolls facing each other than the dolls. 60% of them helped, 20% of them helped wow. if they had seen the dolls facing the way. So the 18 month olds didn't just help anybody, they helped when there was a sense of bonding or friendship there. Mm -hmm. But that cue of the two dolls facing each other was enough for the 18 month old, one and a half years, to know that there's some kind of, and that, that sense of bonding and friendship caused them to react to the experimenter as if she was a friend or someone to help. So it but they didn't help just anybody. Oh my God, so it's inclusive of the context that they're yes. in, not just... It was the, the cue that you, they, even well, though they're only 18 months old, used to, un to understand the context of here's a friend in need as right. opposed to here's not a friend. Oh my goodness. And I'm not gonna help that person. Oh my goodness. So um, imagine that there are two people in a room and one is influenced by the negative experience and the other is influenced by, and there's a warm and cold that's happened in that meeting room. Mm -hmm. People go out of the room and they'll talk about how they felt about the meeting because mm -hmm. we always ask each other, you know, what did you learn and so forth. Mm -hmm. And somebody could then, as a result of what you just said, walk out of a meeting and say, that was a horrible meeting. Mm -hmm. They said, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Were you in the meeting I was in? Sure. Right. Because each one of them might have queued up one moment, snapshot, their movie, and then everything else filtered through that Absolutely. connect or not connect. And, and the other thing about this is, uh, you know, th there's influences of our evolutionary past. These things are hardwired, so clearly this is evolution innate. It's, it's, it's in all of us. But there's, there's, an early ex there's a window of, of opportunity, or if you want to call it of early experience, where not every child has that link form only if they have bonded with their parents, only if they can trust their mother and father, wow. do you have that connection link in the insula. Because if they don't, if they can't, and they don't bond, uh, you, you tend not to have those effects. They don't respond to warmth and they don't trust. And, and those things then, then they follow these kids up. They measure them at one year of age, how closely they had bonded with their mother. Yep. They've been following them up. They're now in their 30s. They have fewer friends in grade school. They have broken up with more uh, of romantic relationships in their 20s. They had fewer friends in high school. And that was predicted by how close they had bonded with their mother at age one. Oh my goodness gracious. So and that early experience sets that link. And yeah. if it's not, what, what, the, what, the, what the environment is telling the child and the, and the and later adult is that you can or you can't trust people. Mm -hmm. And that sets really early. That link sets really early. And if it's not, then the warm and cold effects don't, don't affect them. I guess my curiosity is taking me to talk about this attachment. Is, do you call it disorder? Is that the right way to phrase attachment I disorder? Uh, it or, could be a disorder in extreme cases, but it's just about whether you've securely sure. attached or right. you're not securely attached right. to so, your caretaker. So if it's, and is it your mother and, and or father? It's a caretaker. Back then when they did the studies, it, and now these children are you know, now in their 30s, so back then it was always the mother, but now they do it both mother and father. Okay. Or could it be somebody that takes care of Any, exactly. anybody? Exactly. It's a caretaker. Long, yeah. 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 I had three of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it doesn't really matter. It's whoever is there yeah. and taking care of you as a little baby. That's wonderful. Yeah. And so if you're if you don't have that button, so to speak, turn the attachment button turned on, um, and it's after one year, is there a way that? coaches, for example, people that pick up that sensitivity to mm -hmm. not attaching as they're working with their clients, yeah. is there a way to bring that back? They, they, relationship researchers have come up with scales that measure whether a person's securely attached or anxiously attached or avoidant of relationships, and there's, they actually uh, uh, can sort people and they do research on these different types. So now if uh, you can take those scales, you can find out if the person you're working with is one of these different uh, types. If you're securely attached, everything's great. Uh, but if you're not, then there's things you can do about it. And, and I think uh, couples therapists, you know, they, they look at that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the, the most important thing is to realize that you yourself may not realize this because we don't have memories of being that young. We don't have memories of not of what happened with our mother or father when we were one year of age. And so this is almost like an evolutionary effect on us in that we have no way to know about it. It's something that we have no memory. So let me then dive into conscious and unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, if it happened, is it possible that the pattern of the uh, lack of t connection and touch and so forth is stored in some way in the hippocampus or wherever these things get stored and now go into an unconscious place where you don't remember them consciously, but right. they're still having an impact. You don't understand why you don't get real close to people. Yeah. Cause, right, is that possible? It's that very that's possible. I learned a lot about myself reading this research and mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
that maybe you know something was going on back then I didn't realize and and think once you realize that that uh, it's when you realize that there's these influences coming from your own personal past when you're a very small child or or evolution uh, that kind of thing then you can do something about it because mm -hmm. now it's like well maybe I should be able to trust this person I'm with maybe the feeling of distrust I have isn't because they've done anything it may be because of what happened early in my life and you have mm -hmm. a chance because we, t we trust our feelings we think they're coming from what's ever in front of us right now mm -hmm. so if we're interacting with our, our boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever it is or, or work partner or colleague and we're getting this I don't trust you I don't want to be with you then we, we may and we always have that with people and we notice it's not just this person we have this with lots of people then we might want to think about you know maybe it's not them Mm -hmm. And once we start that, then we start opening to other possibilities and doing something about it. Otherwise, we're going to spend the rest of our life just not trusting people, not getting close to anybody. Yep. So here you're talking about where we're collecting experiences with people, and there's a pattern. We identify a pattern, or our therapist helps us identify a pattern. And then we can, when we have that happen, does it bring these patterns up from the unconsciousness or this idea, yeah. and now puts it in a place where we can? No. 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 What happens? I do not think that happens. I don't okay, think that we happened? can access these things from our early childhood and suddenly they're in our memories and we're aware of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we have to, we know that now these feelings, what we are aware of are the feelings, the feelings of, of anxiety or the feelings of distrust and it's just a feeling. Uh, it's our gut feeling if you want to say that or intuitions. That's helpful. That's helpful. But it's not a, an explicit memory that we suddenly have access to, oh yeah when I was one year old this happened. We're not going to get that. Yeah, unless I've heard about some psychologists who have that, they hypnotize. Mm -hmm. I actually had someone do that for me to try to bring up an experience. Mm -hmm. That's why I was even asking if, if that was possible. I, mean, I could have made it up too, whatever. No, no, it, <laughs> that's possible. I don't know about yeah. hyp hypnosis yeah. very much, yeah. but um, yeah. if, that, if that's possible and the person verifies it. You know, we have this whole issue of, uh, of therapists inducing memories that the person really didn't, didn't have, have. Yeah. and that's a, a dangerous area to For get sure. into. I would just trust the person that they remember that happening or not and right. leave it at that. And, right, uh, right. It wouldn't go any farther. Yeah. So, but what you did say is that feelings, there are feelings that are left that are attachment, not attachment kind of feelings, however we want to talk about it. And so it starts us in a certain direction. Let's go then to your con bigger concept of the consciousness and unconsciousness mm -hmm. story that came out of that work that started out with the warm and cold. Well, right. Tell us more about what was the le leap from a warm and cold to conscious unconscious. Well, that there's all these things going on that we're not aware of that are influencing us. We, we are aware of what we're aware of. And that doesn't mean that that's all there is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, just like with the visible spectrum of light, you can be aware of the, what's visible, but not of all the invisible waveforms that yep. uh, that science has shown that exist. And so uh, one thing is um, people, we all, I, myself included, believe that we understand ourselves and we understand other people based on our experience. But that's only what we're aware of, and we can only make use of what we're aware of. And so it, it goes then to science to find and discover the things that we're not able to come up with on our own. Mm -hmm. And to say that these don't exist just because I'm not aware of it, well, then maybe we can tease it out in these scientific methods and all that. And that's what our lab and other labs have been doing for 30 or so years now. What does that mean, teasing it out? Tell us. By doing experiments that, that uh, put people in different situations to show that things are not, that they can't report on or not aware of still influence them. And you can show one group of people is treated this way, other people that way, like with the warm and cold. Mm -hmm. No one in that study at the end said, well, why did you think this person was trustworthy? Or why did you think they weren't trustworthy? Oh, it's because I held the hot coffee beforehand. They're not no. going to say that. <laughs> None of us would think that. And, right. and it takes science to show that because it's not something we'd ever come up with on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, so now really for the first time, because our, our psychology science has only been around since the 1970s, after mm -hmm. behaviorism finally went away, it's only since the 1970s do we have the systematic and scientific way to understand these unconscious influences. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do is to organize them, make them you know, in some kind of framework that's uh, you know, something we can use in our, in our daily life. So let me say, ask a radical question and you tell me if I'm off, off the wall or, or whether it's part of your studies. Um, is it possible that generationally, we, so we pass genes on, some get passed and some get uh, there's the template genes, which are passed, let's say, a part of what's passed forward. And then we have transcription, which are designed to be impact. We are designed to be impacted by the environment. A parent raises a child, they teach them certain things. That's turning on new genes, sensitivities to people, and so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. So um, what's the, what is brought forward from 
our paleo years, Neolithic years. I mean, is that stuff actually brought forward and becomes part of the unconscious slate or a not? Absolutely. Or we and again, again, it's these feelings and these emotions, which were the, the original, you know, Darwin talked about emotions and how they were the original way people back in millions of years ago were able to communicate before mm -hmm. language and before anything else. That facial expressions of anger or, or fear or joy or, or happiness were communicated and understood by everybody else. And so we were emotionally communicating with everybody else and these feelings that we have of, of, being, of feeling safe or not feeling safe, uh, feeling afraid, uh, these are very powerful old brain kinds of influences that we, we try to make sense of and understand in terms of what's going on around us right now, but often not realizing where they're really coming from and misunderstanding where they're really coming from. So I'm going to ask you again another wild question. Um, that there's, I've learned about the rostromedial prefrontal cortex, which is the like me, not like me part of the brain. And when you meet people, you get feelings. And you're mm -hmm. talking a lot about feelings. So I want to stay on that level. Let's say I meet you, mm -hmm. and I think, wow. It's like, I feel like I've known you before, or mm -hmm. there's something about you that's really special. And you were, generationally, we were connected in 30 years ago, 30 lives ago, mm, you know? Mm. I mean, could, could that like me actually get activated if I'm feeling your genetic code in some way? Again, I said this is a wild question, so you may say, I know you silly lady, but. Well, the, the, here's, it, here's the funny thing about it. Uh, all, the, all the research on um, attraction is mm -hmm. based on how similar you feel to that person. Mm -hmm. uh, all the research on who you help and don't help is based on do you feel like they're similar to you or not? And what that boils down to is, are you kin or not? Do you share genes or not? So Dawkins in The Selfish Gene argued, you know, that we tend to help and, and even sacrifice ourselves for our, our children, our, the ones who are closest to us in right. terms of sharing genes, because at some level we sense that. We sense through similarity, we sense through the same accent, the same uh, dress, the same something, maybe the same musical taste. You know, similarity is so powerful to us in terms of how we relate to others that, yeah. that we then, be, it's, it's another genetic influence on us. Right, and so we make assumptions if I feel comfortable because I've matched up all sorts of things at a very unconscious level but it still enables me to go over and say, I, I, yeah. you know, I really, I just met you, but I feel like we've known yeah. each other for years or whatever, yeah. and now we're off and running in a good, we're priming at that, also priming, right? That I have this feeling you're so good, so all the things you do, I'm putting now in a bucket of feel good when I'm around yeah. you, I trust you. Yeah. And that is part of how our brain goes from unconscious Absolutely. to consciousness. It's an incredibly sophisticated calculation based on uh, looks and things, but how, how do we tell somebody looks enough like us or like our family to be possibly kin and related to us, mm -hmm. to help them and respond positively to them and not to other people? How do we do that? I don't think we really understand that yet. Right. So I've made a lot of assumptions as I'm talking to you, and fortunately I'm somewhat in the right zone. Um, now take us into things that I haven't asked you about your work around consciousness and unconsciousness. I know that our audience is very familiar with priming, and you mm -hmm. use that word as mm -hmm. well, that this unconscious can prime us mm -hmm. in a certain direction. Maybe not the one that's best for us, but it will yeah. do it anyway. But give, me, give us some stories it, and things. It's really, it, what, what's been fun uh, here the last 10 years in our lab at Yale is uh, by, by looking at, at how these deep kinds of um, influences manifest in these very abstract kinds of things like political attitudes and social attitudes. And so for example, in political psychology, it's always been possible to turn a liberal into a conservative in an experiment. And the way you do that is by threatening them. Because when people feel afraid and threatened, they tend to become more conservative in their, poli in their politics and who wow. they would vote for, in their position on social issues, uh, like marijuana legalization or same-sex marriage and things like that. Well, everyone's been able to turn liberals into conservatives. No one's ever been able to turn conservatives into liberals hmm. until we did. And the way we did it was, if you think about it, pretty obvious, but no one had done it. We made people feel very safe. The opposite of feeling anxious and afraid and how do we do that? Well, I have a, a student who uh, came up with this on her own, Julie Wang, who is wow. a graduate student, now a professor at Stony Brook, uh, who came up with this imagination exercise. And it's all conscious, all imagination. I love it. And a genie comes to you and grants you a superpower. And you have this dream, and it's, you richly imagine this happening to you. And the superpower is either that you can fly, which is actually the number one preferred superpower to fly. I, I would want that one. Um, or that you're invulnerable to physical harm. Nothing, you wouldn't get cut, bullets would bounce off you like Superman, Superman if you fell, yeah, like, yeah, if you exactly. fell, nothing bad. You're invulnerable to physical harm and nothing bad can happen to you. So you're totally physic physically safe. 
They do that, and then we have them take the standard uh, questionnaires on conservative liberal attitudes that always show the big difference between conservatives and liberals uh, in terms of those social issues and so forth. For the fly condition, which we didn't expect to change anything, you get those big differences. Conservatives are more conservatives than liberals, big deal. But after they've imagined themselves to be physically safe, there's now no difference. Conservatives have come down and now are just as liberal as the liberals about same-sex marriage, legalization of marijuana, resistance to social change, immigration policy, and all of those things. What I heard in my years is that people that are conservative are, have fears of certain things happening. The word conservative is to conserve something, right? It's to not do something. But yet by imagining that they could have these superpowers to handle all those things, mm -hmm. I might be afraid, but I can handle them, mm -hmm. that it literally changes their voting rights, so to speak, about yeah. what they believe. That's Fascinating. Does that hold, or is that only at the, ex the time of the experiment? Oh, no, no, no. We're not changing anyone. For okay, I just, no, no, I just no, no, wanted no. to know if there was no. a special button to do no, that. No, no. <laughs> but if you, you, you remember Roosevelt's uh, uh, famous speech in 1933, his inauguration address, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Mm -hmm. He's a liberal, and he's basically saying, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have things right before elections, often the person in power will say, oh, we have this, we've discovered this terrorist threat or some horrible threat to make people feel nervous and afraid, so they don't want change. They want to reelect the person who's already in power. Right. Uh, Barack Obama, his last inauguration in, in 2016, also said we must resist the politics of fear. Mm -hmm. Macron, the pr a French prime minister, just gave an address to Congress where he said we should not, not uh, uh, move people around by these emotions of fear and anger. So these are levers that politicians definitely know and can move us around to be conservative and liberal. And they've known it for some time and they use it. Uh, it's, it's time for us to also realize that these levers work on us and not say, ah, you know, this doesn't matter because it actually matters. We never wanted just to make conservatives liberal. Remember, the past research had always taken liberals and made them conservative. So it goes both ways. Um, this is fascinating. So what our um, audience is learning and you're reinforcing is that what we say before we start the bigger speech, so to speak, speak is the priming of that moment and how they listen and how they hear what you have to say is going to be different depending on whether you're trying to get them uh, anxious a little bit and, and right. having them think, oh, therefore I need you, if yes. that's what you're trying to get from that person. Yes. Or, or I'm here to help us all be safe and have a great future. And one right. or the other is going to turn the warm or the cold on. Right. And that is how we listen and see and hear and interpret that's everything. Right. It's going to move us around and we may not want our voting decisions and other you know, political beliefs to be moved around by these emotions of fear and, mm -hmm. and safety. Maybe our own self-interest. You know? yep. Maybe you want to give that a shot for a while exactly. it's, uh, instead of these emotions. It's fascinating. So I want to make sure that I ask you the kind of questions that where you have secrets inside that I haven't heard yet and that we haven't heard yet. What, what are some things that you think will help our audience? Again, they're coaches, leaders, people from 75 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. through almost 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, is the wisdom, in addition to all the great things sure. you've said, that you want us to plant in our brains and remember? The from, life hacks, right? Yeah, the, life hacks. the hacks, right. Right. Uh, number one, I, I just did an interview with Parents Magazine, and uh, I just want to stress this. We have a natural connection in us when we're infants between physical warmth and social warmth, between feeling physical warmth and trusting people. And parents, if they would know that, you know, a lot of parents, well, you know, I hug my kid once in a while. No, hug them a lot. Make them feel physically warm. If your child comes home from kindergarten or second grade and they've had a bad day and they've been teased or something, make them something warm. Don't tell them, oh, this will help you feel better. Don't give it away. Don't tell them the story. But just give them warm experiences because that really, it, there's a natural connection there. And especially when they're young, when they're one year, two years, you know, give them lots of warmth. Let them feel your body warmth, and that'll set them up. It'll pay off the rest of their life in, wow. in terms of uh, better relationships, more friends, and everything else. Once you know that, that connection's hardwired in. Use it uh, to help your child. Turn the lights on for turn, them. It's it's yeah. easy. It's it's no it's no problem to do this. And, yeah. uh, and once you know the trick. The other is our work on imitation and mimicry mm -hmm. uh, has basically showed that this naturally happens with people. When they're looking at each other without trying, they'll tend to take the same body posture, the same emotional expression. It mimics, right. Is it that just, mirror neurons? It's mirror neurons, and yeah. it happens without trying. Mm -hmm. So the worst thing you can do is try to do it. You don't need to try to do it. Uh, and then the nice thing about that is there's all these wonderful consequences that happen with this bonding. The person will like you better, you'll bond, they'll trust you more. 
uh, and it's been taken out into the field with uh, waitresses get more tips if they repeat yes. back the order of a customer and mm -hmm. uh, French department stores make more sales of MP3 players if they repeat back what the wow. customer says. Wow. And these are big effects of 80% sales versus 60% sales. That's huge. So these people have taken it out into the yeah. field and, and shown how important this is. How do we do it in our normal life? It's so simple. All you have to do, and I'm guilty of not doing this myself because I'll tell you why, but all we have to do is look at the other person. Eye contact. Well, not even, yes, look, eye right, contact, and but I can look at your nose. I mean, as long as I'm looking in your general area, yep. I'll pick up enough that my, the natural imitation mimicry will happen. Yep. You will like me more. You'll feel like the interaction went more smoothly. And all you have to do, the people who turn out, uh, who score high on empathy scales, mm -hmm. those classic, these uh, standard empathy, sa empathy scales, we ran them in our study, in our, in our imitation studies, and found that they imitated the other person more. Mm -hmm. So people who are naturally empathic what they do is they pay more attention to the person. So people might ask, well, if you know that that's, quote, a potential trick, I'm using that word, right, very, very lightly, um, then will people sense that in some cases it's an authentic connecting and in other cases it's a, you if know, you try too hard, I think th I think that's yeah. the trying too hard that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, when you're like you're trying to imitate and I'm trying to do this, yeah. they, they catch on to that kind of thing. Yeah. And that, it's not, it's not, that's not necessary. Yeah. Because really, it, it all happens if you just pay attention to the person, yeah. and that's all there is to it. I have to tell you something funny. I studied NLP years ago, and I studied in California from Jeannie Laborde as it's applied to sales. Mm -hmm. She was brilliant. I took had a doctor and a wife couple. They were actually both doctors, he and she. And they set me up so that there were two seats and I was there and I saw them, I felt them mimicking in a, an intentional way, not natural. Yeah, yeah. And I, everything they said after that, they wanted to do a book with me and the whole deal. And in my mind, they were on my mm list, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's how sensitive human beings are to yes. truthfulness and, you, and you, reality. You detected yeah. that they were trying to manipulate you. Exactly. And, uh, and they were pretty clumsy at it. Yes. And, and when people do that, that's not a good sign. Yep. Can't, you can't trust them. Yep. John, there's so many things that you've been talking about. I wish we had another four hours or four days or four months to cover everything. Um, and I hope that our coaches will have an opportunity to pick up your book because I know there's so much more I read it. And I, in fact, this is what I did in, in reading it. I don't know if everybody can see this, but I have pages here with notes of all the pages that I have to go, had to go back to. Then I have them here, you know, notes here. So you have to understand there's so much in here. You know that, there's no quiz on Friday, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, okay. it's just... Um, it's like a textbook, yeah. It, it, well, maybe that's what this is becoming for oh. me. Um, it's really fascinating, and, and I just love it. And so you, you reinforce a lot of things, but there are a couple of new things. And we have what's called a Wikipedia, mm -hmm. at, uh, and we cr collect words that we're using in our work mm -hmm. that people don't know, like priming, people didn't know what priming was, so mm -hmm. we gave them that. But you have one word you used, um, hacking. Mm -hmm. and we talked about it before our interview. Yeah. Could you talk about what hacking actually yeah, means? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's, it's taking some piece of knowledge that you might not think applies here, but it, it, uh, it can be used to get what you want or help you get what you want or do something good or something or, positive, like you know, looking at somebody, just paying attention to them when you're meeting them, has a nice little uh, effect of bonding and liking. That's the yeah. that comes but it's activates. so simple and so easy to do. Uh, and, you know, I don't do it naturally because I'm so, like many people, I don't remember a person's name after I meet them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I didn't listen when they were saying their name. Well, why wasn't I listening? Because I was so worried about what I was going to say next, some witty or some smart thing, that I was so internally focused. I wasn't focused on them. Mm -hmm. So I've learned from this is like, you know, it really helps to yeah. just pay attention and listen to them and not be so worried about what I'm going to say next. And it really helps. Yep. So what you are defying, in my mind, um, are the rules that I was given years ago when I studied psychology, which is you have to do a thousand things in a new direction in order for it to stick. Hmm. And I, what I tell coaches, and it may or, not, may or may not be true, is that when we're doing it that way, it's our neocortex that's working, and it may need a lot to change the balance of the mm -hmm. scale. But if we do it with a combination of our gut and our prefrontal cortex and our heart, mm -hmm. it's a different part of our brain. Mm -hmm. And literally, we feel, and the arithmetics inside our brain shifts much more easily. So if a mother mm -hmm. keeps hugging a child at night where they hadn't before, mm -hmm. there's that warmth is going to start to switch that child right. to even experience and think about the parent in a completely different it way. It will change their brain. It their will change the wiring of their hear. brain yep. for the rest of their life in a good yep. way. And that's amazing right. <laughs> that that would happen. Yeah, so we talk about how, teaching leaders how to down-regulate or do less of something, 
and upregulate doing more of something, and it doesn't have to take a thousand, number one. Number right. two, the brain is very sensitive to differences, mm -hmm. so it picks it up, and you can establish a new pattern mm -hmm. much more easily. Am I on track with that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, a lot of times when you talk about unconscious influences or things that are happening without the person being aware, a lot of people get a, a little nervous and worried because, you know, it's, it's a little scary that all these things are going on without your knowing it. It's like there's people in your apartment or house that you don't know about or something like that and then makes you a little nervous. And, uh, you know, the, the old Freudian idea of an unconscious mind is a separate mind that was walled off and closed off from mm -hmm. us and it was the source of destructive impulses and, and things that were bad for us and that's not the way it is. Our, our unconscious workings of our mind, it's the same mind. It, it works unconscious mode, conscious mode, but it's the same mind and it's, it's, it's all thanks to evolution and natural selection, basically adaptive and trying to help us get what we want and help us make friends and bond and, and connect with our parents and all these things are good things. It's mm -hmm. nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. But the one thing you want to do is know about them mm -hmm. because when you know about them, you can use them. And one thing that I really used in when I was writing the book and I was doing anything since, I took, tell my students you know, to use this in, in what they're working on, is give yourself, when you have a, an important goal, get it, get it going early. Now, don't wait, I mean, it's not just a matter of waiting until the last minute to do something. But for example, I would write a chapter and I'd be done and finish the chapter and I've got a deadline and, and boy, I could just say, oh, it's noon, I could take the rest of the day off, I'll get the next tomorrow. But what I always did was to get the next chapter material out, look through it, get my mind into that, and then go have fun, go to the beach, or the a picnic or, or, or you know do something with my wife or you know something like that uh, I'd always get it loaded up and in my mind working on it and then let my mind have it and work on it uh, for itself in the background is your unconscious mind then working let's say you set up your table you're ready to go it's you're now orienting yourself in a certain direction is the reticular activating system part of that? I don't know. You don't know. I'm not a, don't, I don't really know that, that part. Right. Yeah, that yeah. part. I don't know which part, but I do know that when you get back the next day, uh, it's there for you. Mm -hmm. it's work has happened. And, and we all have this experience of having something on the tip of our tongue. Yep. And we're trying to remember. We're trying to remember. We know we know it. We just can't remember it. And then we forget about it. We forgot even we're trying to remember it. Then 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock that night, it Boom. pops into our head. How does that happen except unless it's been working on it for us, trying to solve it, and, and then pops into our head when it finally finds the answer? Is that the unconscious mind in a different way, different story about it? It's not saved the past, but it's working on it in within 24 hours. Yes. It's now... It's the unconscious never sleeps. It's yeah. working on the background. Uh, oftentimes, computers have tasks that they do when you're not using them. Mm -hmm. They do kinds of maintenance things, the or they do up. kinds of clean-up clean things. Up. They do that in the background when you're not, uh, when yeah. you're not aware of what's going on. Yeah. It, it really, really helps. Mm -hmm. The other thing it does is it lets you see opportunities that you wouldn't have seen otherwise because when goals are operating they tend to pick up uh, things that are relevant to them that are opportunities to to uh, attain the goal and things like that mm -hmm. I would be uh, knowing I'm, I'm going grocery shopping I make a list okay and I'm walking out and I smell the cat litter box and ah, boom I need cat litter and like I wouldn't have thought that and remembered it except that I was in the mode of what do I need to buy at the store that we need at home and things like that will be picked up by the goal that's operating of what do I need to buy at the store and things like that you'll notice that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise all right again I'm gonna go off on the edge of maybe weird and wacko but um, when you do that when you plant these ideas in your head and you think about them um, some people have talked about it. it's almost like the law of attraction. If it's out there, now your readiness for finding that is up to the ante. Absolutely. Instead of just seeing this part in front of you, you've widened your frame of reference, right. your eyes start to see things, feel that you can feel right. something happening, and then you can go for it. That's, right. That's the brain it. is that sensitive. The, and the, they've done studies on subliminal advertising, for example, mm -hmm. and subliminal advertising doesn't work except when the person is in the need state of being mm. hungry or being thirsty. And then we're much more sensitive to cues about something being there to eat or drink. And then actually then those, those kinds of ads can be effective. Yeah. But only when the person has that goal or need state very strongly at that time. So the, some of the things that our uh, coaches and leaders need to be thinking about with their teams and with the people that they work with is before the, at the end of the day, maybe even pulling out from people, what are some things that you really loved about our work together? Mm -hmm. Or something so that you get a positive, exciting feeling about this team. Mm -hmm. And then at night, there's some pruning around, well, what else was positive? It almost gives them a goal towards mm -hmm. which to continue to move. If you, instead of a leader saying, 
today was really not good. You guys didn't deliver. You guys didn't even show up, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. people think that that's going to help people. It's not. Right. It's going oppositely Absolutely. against the way the brain is naturally designed. It's what you want to do tomorrow and, yeah. and getting that going in the day before and then just forgetting about it because you got it. It's working. It'll help you. You'll wake up. You'll have, you'll have something there. And there's one more of these, and I think this is the most powerful life hack of all, mm -hmm. and that's when we want to change what we're doing right Please. now. When we want to change and get rid of a bad habit mm -hmm. or when we, when we want to start a good new habit. And I, I did, I wouldn't say consulting, but I met with people at St. Luke's uh, Roosevelt Hospital who in the, in the cardiac, cardiologists uh, a few years ago. And they said, they, they looked at me and they said, John, look, I've got these people coming in. These guys are 38, 42 years old. They're going to die if they don't exercise. Their heart, they, they, they just don't exercise. Their heart is weak. And if they don't start exercising, they're going to die. They know it. And yet they don't exercise. Mm -hmm. They come back into my office the next time. And, and I say, well, how have you been doing? Said, Doc, I know I just never remember to do it. I can't remember. So the problem is they're not remembering. This is a, a strong intention they have. They know their life depends on it. Yeah. And yet they're not able to do it. Now, we know from, from unconscious priming influences that primes are out there in the world and they activate behaviors like the warm and cold thing, but they activate things in our head and they do it naturally without our trying to do it and they cause these goals or these things to happen. Mm -hmm. Why not put that to your advantage and your use? Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is make your intention but tie it to something you know is going to happen in the future. When I had my little girl and I, I would come home from work, sometimes work carried over and I would mm -hmm. have people at work, students, everybody asking me to do this, journals, review this paper, student, read this paper, give me advice, do this. I was always doing this thing, oh, I'd go home and my daughter would run, to this little kid, running to the door, daddy, daddy, and oh, look at my paintings I did today, look at what I did today, look at my beads, look at this, like, oh, yet another person wanting my attention, I just want to chill, I've had a long day. Yeah. Instead of that, and then I, and I would make her feel, and I would re feel guilty and horrible a few minutes later and come back, and of course. But um, I do not want to consider coming home and her wanting my attention to be the same as carrying over from my work. So I did one of these things. We call them implementation intentions. I mm -hmm. said, when I come home and I set foot on the driveway after I get out of the car, this is something that always happens. I've never once driven home from work and stayed in my car all night. Mm -hmm. I've always opened the door <laughs> and gotten out. So it's a Thank very God. reliable thing that's going to happen. So yeah. I tie this as a prime. I'm saying in the future, when I get home and I set my foot on the driveway, I will be glad, feel glad for being home. I will forget my work. I'll focus on how lucky I have to have this wonderful daughter who loves me and wants to share things with me. And I'm going to go in there and have a wonderful evening and, and focus on her and pay total attention to her. And I made this intention so that even if I'm driving home and forgetting that I had this intention, as soon as I stepped on the driveway, I remembered it. Wow. So and I use priming. I set it in advance. And I've had things where I forgot to bring a book in for a colleague who wanted the book. And I over and over, did you have it? No, I forgot. No, I forgot. No, I forgot. Well, uh, what I did was I said, OK, the first thing I do when I get to my apartment is I'm going to go get the book and put it in my briefcase. Mm -hmm. And I forgot all about it. I come home. It's dark. And I haven't even turned the lights on. I find myself walking into the bedroom. Why am I walking into the bedroom? Yeah. And I'm right standing in front of my desk, and there's the book. Ah. <laughs> and so I put it in my briefcase and it solved that. So these things are delegating control over your behavior to the, so this is how you break a bad habit. When I come home, the first thing I'm going to do is change into my running clothes right. and my running shoes. Uh -huh. So you find yourself going upstairs, taking off your work clothes, and suddenly you're putting on your running clothes. Like, what am I doing? Ah. Uh -huh. And it breaks. It, it's a way to carry out Break a good intention that you're not able to carry out consciously, even though you try and try and try. With the cardiologist, I gave these guys advice. I said, look, when they drive home and they, they put their foot on the driveway, they're gonna, I want to go for a walk around the neighborhood. I'm going to walk for 10 blocks before I even go in my house. And that's what they did. Wow. And for the first time, they were exercising. Is there a chemical shift that takes place in the brain that anchors something like that so that it does become more I'm conscious? Sure. I'm yeah. sure. It, it, it's, it, it's something that when it happens, it's like boom, and suddenly your, your intention, it, you're reminded of it. Okay. So you know immediately when you see yourself putting on your running shoes or you set foot and you start walking down the street away from your house, you, re or you, you find yourself in front of the book that you need to remember mm -hmm. to bring in to work. Yep. At that point, you remember because yeah. it's something you consciously want to do but are having trouble doing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's life or death. Mm. Is it lodged in your unconscious? At, it's set up in, in advance way? so that when that future event happens, it acts it. So the outside work, it's like when we go home, like right now, if you imagine your house, 
I can vaguely, sort of, but boy, is it so much more powerful when I'm there. Mm -hmm. And there's the house and there's the driveway and there's bushes. It's such a more powerful experience. Yep. You're setting it up so when that powerful experience happens, that intention or goal that you had is also triggered because that's the context that you're linking it to. Right. So John, I just learned a new word for my uh, we, uh, Wikipedia, which is hacking. And it sounded like it was a bad thing, but clearly it's a good thing when you set into motion something that will be a change for you that is really important in your life. Yeah, it's, it's hacking is a change, it's right? A change. It's a change, and, and uh, mm -hmm. it's, if you want it to happen, then it's a change that is good for you. Yeah, so otherwise great. you wouldn't want it to happen. Great. Well, you have given us so many things that are good for us today. We studied. It's been fun. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm so You're glad welcome. we did this. Like. Uh, a uh, long time no see. <laughs> yeah. Well, it had to wait till I got it done. You know, yeah, I didn't yeah. know these things myself at the yeah. time. So. Well, this is a well-baked cake, and it's got yeah. so much value for the people that I spend a lot of time with every day, and I know they're going to love it, and they're going to experiment, and I'm going to keep you up to speed with, we call them magical moments. Oh, please do. When something really unexpectedly from the work that they've been learning is a technology that helps them radically change something that they thought they were Great. stuck with for their whole life. So I'm going to share I some of that I would love to hear those stories, yeah. Yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's wonderful. Yeah. So I want to uh, thank all of our uh, people online and the people that study our work, Conversational Intelligence. You've given us amazing things to, um, to add to and expand our repertoire of what is possible to help human beings become better at being a human being. Keep up the great work. It's Thank so you. needed. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So great to see you in person.